Uh, it's my great pleasure to officially kick off the 2019 Connected Learning Summit. Uh, uh, I'm Mimi Ito, I direct the Connected Learning Lab, and on behalf of my fellow faculty, uh, students, postdocs, and amazing staff who helped put together the event, uh, I'd like to welcome you to the University of California, Irvine, and to beautiful Orange County. Uh, before I officially recognize all of the people who, and institutions who contributed to the event, I wanted to first recognize all of you who came from near and far to be with us today. Uh, can you raise your hand if you're from Southern California? Okay. How about uh, West Coast, Western region? Okay. How about East Coast? Oh, wow. <laughs> uh, how about uh, Midwest? Oh, nice. Uh, you can raise your hand for more than one. How about South? How are we doing on the South? Yay! Oh, that's awesome. Okay, how many of you are in urban areas? Wow, okay, our cities are here. Suburban, I guess I count myself that. Oh, wow, how about rural? Wow, yay! <laughs> um, okay, how many of you identify as researchers or scholars? Okay, I would say that's a third. How about uh, educational practitioners and administrators? Again, you can be more than one. You can have more than one identity. Uh, how about uh, government, nonprofit, philanthropy? Wow, this is a pretty good, even mix. And how about commercial? Oh, my computers. <laughs> Sorry, we had to disconnect my computers, a so very uh, indicative of our theme here. Uh, <laughs> Uh, how about commercial uh, startups, or if you participate in the commercial sector at all, can you raise your hand? Okay, pretty good. Uh, how many of you are coming to a Connected Learning Summit, DML, Sandbox Summit, or GLS for the first time? This is your first. Whoa, awesome. Okay, so I hope you uh, paid attention to exactly who raised their hand for what, and that especially if you're an old timer, you'll take the opportunity to reach out to somebody new at the event to make a new connection, um, but also to make sure over the course of the next few days that you take the time to connect with somebody who may represent a sector, or a kind of institution, organization, or practice that's not part of your own uh, life world. Uh, so I think what makes this community so so unique and different from other professional conferences is the fact that we represent genuine diversity among so many, along so many vectors, research and practice, region, across commercial, nonprofit, uh, government, uh, and academic sectors. So I think the real opportunity here is to connect across this diversity because you are with a community that shares a set of core values about leveraging today's uh, networked and digital world for uh, learning that is genuinely learner and youth-centered, uh, that is about play and joy and engagement, uh, and maybe most importantly, uh, learning that's oriented toward the core uh, societal goals of equity and justice for all young people. And I think that's really what makes this community unique. So thank you for joining us. Uh, on to the official, okay, I might need help. There we go. Uh, so in addition to the Connected Learning Lab, uh, uh, this event is co-hosted by MIT's uh, Scheller Teacher Education Program. Uh, whoa. Okay. Uh, the Connected Learning Li Alliance is our broader network of partners who are part of the movement for connected learning. Uh, and uh, the event is uh, generously supported by <coughs> the MacArthur Foundation, Hewlett Packard, and MIT Open Learning. And I'd also like to recognize our amazing committee and all the peer reviewers who helped uh, review the submissions, curate the panels, and do so much of the organizational work uh, behind the scenes to make this event happen. So a big hand for our amazing committee. Okay, without further ado, I'm going to uh, let Eric, one of our co-hosts, introduce our opening session. Thanks. 
Uh, I'm Eric Klopfer uh, from the Scheller Teacher Education Program at MIT, um, and it's my pleasure to introduce the first panel, um, which will be hosted and moderated by Henry Jenkins, who I'll tell you a little bit about, and then he will in turn tell you about the panel. I'll, I'll read just very briefly from Henry's um, blog um, under the entry, Who the Blank is Henry Jenkins? <laughs> you can read it yourself, the title. Uh, he is the Provost Professor of Communication, Journalism, Cinematic Arts, and Education at USC, where he's been since 2009. And at that point, I'll turn off my phone, because the rest of this will be a little bit personal. Um, it's for, for, for me, Henry is, uh, is uh, sort of like a slightly older cousin who I get his hand-me-downs. And they're really nice hand-me-downs. Um, and I will say, in, in reality, I'm a little bit short, so I actually got hand-me-downs from a, a younger cousin. But in this case, I'll just be a little bit older. <laughs> Um, and uh, so Henry has created the, the educational games movement at MIT. He created comparative media studies at MIT, which both of which I now inherit from him. Um, I inherit his hairline from him as well, as you can see now. Um, and um, and it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's been a really uh, wonderful opportunity to be able to have those things that he created at MIT and made them such wonderful things that, that continue to live on, um, even though he is now on this other coast. Um, I will also say, as, as a, a slightly older and maybe more precocious older cousin, he's also extremely prolific in his writing. He's written over 17 books. Um, if, you, if you go to his blog, Confessions of an Aka Fan, um, he's a prolific writer there um, with, with entries, any one entry of which would sort of like make anyone in this room think this was like a, a book in and of itself. Um, he's written books um, uh, on, on many different topics. Uh, on convergence culture, uh, uh, the, a great book uh, from Barbie to Moral Combat. Uh, you should look at the titles of his books. There's a new one called uh, a newer one that I didn't know about called Hop on Pop, which has another subtitle, but it's not a, it's not just a total ripoff of uh, Dr. Seuss. Uh, but uh, but really a, a, a tremendous writer in so many areas of, of media scholarship um, and its connections, as you'll see today, with activism, community building, um, and and youth culture. Um, so with that, I'll say thank you to Henry and uh, welcome to the stage. guys want to fill in? There you go. So I wanted to continue Mimi's hand raising uh, game for a minute, because uh, she didn't ask how many of you consider yourself activist. And given the light of our panel, that's an important. So if you consider yourself an activist, whatever you do in your day job, raise your hand. So this tells us something about the current moment that we're in. Have a seat, guys. So. I'm up here in part uh, because I'm co-author of a book with Sangeeta Shrestova over there called, uh, the, called uh, By Any Media Necessary, The New Youth Activist. And I also am going to shamelessly plug the newest of the books, Participatory Culture Interviews, which I guess is the other reason I'm up here. But a number of people speaking at the conference are included in this collection of interviews about participatory culture, politics, and learning and maybe of interest to people here. But I'm really here today to, to listen to the two activists on either side of us. And this, this episode is brought to us by the letter J, because uh, we have Jessica here, we have Justin here, and I have Jenkins. So you, it's, we're, we're gonna call ourselves the three J's this morning. Um, yeah, well, we've worked out this color scheme. So it goes from his purple and black to my purple to her black, it, it all kinds of, Gels, we, we really coordinated carefully here. Um, so I thought I'd have each of, each of you introduce yourself, tell us a little of your origin story and a little bit about what kind of activism you're involved with. Um, I'm gonna ask them if some questions to get us started. I'm gonna turn it over to you guys at some point and uh, let you guys jump in with some questions as well. So I'll be formulating some questions as we go. So Jessica. My name is Jessica Riestra. I am originally here from Orange County, so I'm very excited to be back. Um, I currently am a senior in Sacramento State, so it's like it's really exciting to be able to get the customs because I really miss Orange County. Um, but besides that, in regards towards the work I've done, I am currently one of the directors for March for Our Lives California. I don't know if many of you know, in regards to how the organization started, a lot ha happened with what happened in Parkland, Florida in 2018, where 17 people were killed on February 14th. It became a whole sense of a revolution where 
young people came together to be able to fight against like this whole aspect of gun violence. And then this eventually ended up having different statewide organizations. So now every single state throughout the whole country has their individual March for Our Lives chapter. So that's a little bit in regards to like the work I'm currently doing. Uh, however, like my activism goes back a little bit. I really started getting involved in high school with just being whether it was a legislative intern to actually working for uh, the California Democratic Party. I've been able to do a lot within such a small time. And it has been able to give me that sense of privilege to be able to connect with a lot of young people. I'm all about young people being a young person myself. So like it really is such a motivation to be able to work from people from the age range of like 10 to the age of 23. And that for me exemplifies where we currently are, where young people are really taking a stance to make sure that their voices are being heard. And we've been able to see this throughout different movements, such as the Sunrise Movement, March for Our Lives, so many varieties of movements. And I think it really encompasses the power of youth and how much power and their voices carry. So I take that with pride. But besides that, I think in regards to lightly connecting and how I got into activism, a lot has to do with what happened in 2016 when we got uh, the new president of the United States. And for me, it was such a turning point in my life, more specifically, because when he was actually running for president, he came to Orange County. He actually went to the OC Fairgrounds, which is right across from the street where, uh, from the street where I went to, because I transferred from Orange Coast College. So by being able to like go there, I was called so many names that I was never called before, whether it's like going back to my country, like it's like, uh, immigrants are not welcome here, and like just a variety of different stuff. I, I never have faced as much hate as I encountered in that time. And for me, that was like such a turning point because it's like I'm an Orange County native. These are the people that I live with throughout my whole lives. So it was just something that really hurt me to like my core because it's like this is happening within my individual community. That's not to say that this is not happening more on a nationwide scale. So that really empowered and pushed me to take a stance and make sure, especially being a Latina woman of color, to make sure that my voice and the voices of all my community members were heard. Hello, everybody. I'm Justin Scott. I'm originally from Baltimore, Maryland. Um, I moved to Los Angeles in 10th grade, but right before I moved, um, I was in ninth grade, and um, this was around the time that Freddie Gray got killed. Um, so my first uh, real experience with activism was during that time. I saw my city be in an uproar. I saw everybody angry. I was angry, and I, was, I, I felt like I was young enough to still have um, a certain level of innocence when it came to this anger and when it came to my voice, but I also understood that I had um, power to actually make change, to be heard, and to really see what happens when people stand up for what they believe in. Um, that was my first real time seeing uh, literally outside of my house, people marching, um, people really just standing up for their own uh, community. And I felt like that's something that I had to do. Um, so I was very active in that. Uh, and then I moved to Los Angeles during my sophomore year of high school. And when I got out here, I started to realize that uh, certain learning conditions that, I was, that was normalized for me as a, a black male growing up in Baltimore City, um, it, it was very normal to see your educational facilities be very dirty, very broken down. You have textbooks from more than 15 years ago. Um, so those conditions were, were very normalized for me. And coming here to Los Angeles, or not here, but yeah, coming to Los Angeles and, and seeing that um, those conditions for students of color were persistent, were the same across the nation, um, really took me for a loop. 
and I knew that I had to do something about it because uh, no matter where you go in this nation, students of color have a very different educational experience than those of our white counterparts. So um, uh, with that being said, I got involved with an organization called Students Deserve. Uh, in this organization, we fight to end the criminalization of black, brown, and Muslim youth within education, um, specifically within the Los Angeles School Unified School District. Um, and so for the past two, uh, well, for, for about three years or so, we were fighting to end a uh, racist random search policy that had no true um, criteria for, for random and no true procedures for how these searches should be done. So what ended up happening is that uh, students of color were disproportionately targeted, targeted by these searches, um, pulling us out of class, removing things such as highlighters, scissors, hand sanitizer, things that we actually need to be successful in school, um, rather than actually protecting us and making us feel safe. Um, so uh, throughout those, pretty much all of my high school experience in Los Angeles, I've been working with uh, Students Deserve. I became a leader in Students Deserve. Um, we work closely with Black Lives Matter, United Black Student Unions of uh, California. So with all of these organizations, I've just always made it to a point to um, be the voice for students of color within education. I feel like we deserve a lot more from this educa public education school system. Um, and um, I just wanted to make sure that we got those resources. So yeah, that's me. Thank you. Thank you. So I think you've already got a sense of some of the things I discovered in beginning to talk to the, my two guests about this program, how deeply motivated and passionate they are about their causes, what exceptional young people they are, how articulate they are. One of the things that came up as we spoke was the importance of self-care, right? Motivation, dr being driven, absolutely important but also there's an awareness that they're in it for the long haul, that there is a lot of wear and tear right now that all of us experience as we do our activism. And so Justin shared with us uh, an exercise he does with his group to get people taking care of themselves. So I wanted to begin with that ritual today. Yes, okay, so I'm gonna stand up. Uh, you all can stay seated. Um, <laughs> but um, an important part of, like, Mr. Jenkins said, an important part of activism is really understanding yourself so that you can actually help your community rather than um, just allowing your negative feelings to just um, uh, really leak into all of your relationships with all of these other people. Uh, so what we're gonna do is I want everyone to visualize a bubble surrounding you and only you. And in this bubble, it's just you, yourself, and you, but we're all connected. All of our bubbles are connected. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna take three deep breaths. When you breathe in, I want you to visualize all of your positive intentions, everything that you want to happen, everything that's great that's going on in your life, everything that you're grateful for, um, and just all good things. I want you to inhale that. And when you exhale, I want you to exhale everything that's unneeded, all of your negative feelings, all of your just baggage that you don't need to be in this conversation, in this room right now, so that we can get grounded in this space, in this space of love and in this space of just unity. So you can't inhale anybody else's negative because you have your bubble, but you can definitely inhale all of that positive because we're all connected. So we're gonna start on the count of three, okay? One, two, three, breathe in, breathe out. Breathe in, breathe out. Last one, breathe in, breathe out and make some noise. <laughs> There we go, y'all feel that? I feel it, I feel it, I feel it. Okay, now we're grounded, now we're here, let's continue. Okay. Yeah. So Jessica, in your organizational work, what practices of self-care are you seeing? Um, 
Well, in regards to what we do, there's a lot of students that actually don't know how to take a break. I think we are seeing that become a custom where we take so much in. So what we do is that we have someone check on each other. We make it a point that like you have to check on each other. So being the person that oversees uh, the California State Region, I make sure to like with my different uh, chapter leaders to check on them. Just be able to, to like whether it's like you could call me at any time, like you could be able to like text me, like uh, so on. But then I also have my person that oversees me that checks on me because the whole point is that we need to support each other in this whole cause because it can be a little bit straining. It could be a little bit time consuming, especially when you're a student and then like you're also trying to do activism work. It becomes a little bit problematic uh, at times. So, uh, but we have this sense of balance where like we have all young people support one another and I think it really makes it, makes us stronger because we know that no matter what, like if anything you have the support of another person, even if you might not feel that you need it, you have someone that would always check up on you to make sure that you're doing well. So. Well, thank you. So we're talking about activism today. Uh, the, so many of you would have read the blog post that I sent out ahead of the conference, but maybe for those who haven't had a chance, could you explain to us what each of you means by activism? Uh, Jessica, why don't you continue? And then. For me, activism a lot means standing up for what you believe in. It means just taking a stance for those that can't be able to take a stance. I could be able to talk from personal experience most of my family is still undocumented, so a lot of them don't have the ability to be able to express their voice uh, for the fear of persecution, especially currently where, we're, uh, where we are in within the immigration aspect. So for me, a lot of my activism realm surrounds them, being able to know that they have someone that's standing up for what's right, someone that is standing up to be able to empower the next generation to be able to tell them that in the end, like the best that we can do is being able to stand in solidarity. I think it's the sense of unity, putting like your differences aside, but being able to understand that you have to stand together for what's right and go against what's wrong. So activism is something that really encompasses my whole life, simply because I have a lot of my family members that don't have that sense of privilege where they could actually be able to express themselves. So I use their voice to empower me, to hopefully empower other people to make sure that in the end, the best that we can do is stand together against all these hardships that we currently are facing as a nation. Justin? Um, I believe that activism uh, really has a lot to do with community. I feel like when we have conversations about activism, we don't put enough emphasis on um, the level of community work that you need to do. There is a lot that has to be done with policy, uh, legislation, but we always need to make it a point to understand we are standing up for communities, vulnerable communities, people that may not be able to use their voice the way that we can. So being as though, I, uh, activists have this platform, we should use this platform to make sure that we're always in, working in the best interest of the community that we're representing. Um, so activism has a lot to do with community, it has a lot to do with love. Um, love, as cliche as it may sound, has a lot to do with activism. You have to love the people because that's what's gonna keep us all connected that common humanity between each and every person in this room is activism, and acknowledging that is activism. Because when we acknowledge that we're all loving human beings, then we have this, uh, we're, we're all, we have this unionship and this companionship built in automatically. Um, so I think being an activist and being in activist work has a lot to do with love. But then too, um, again, uh, it, it's, it's about the community, but then it's also connecting the community to uh, resources or policies or legislation that they may not have the access to, may not have the education uh, to, uh, about, um, may not have the resources to um, have a prominent voice. 
Uh, so I think it's our job as activists to be that voice, to put our community on that platform, and to constantly make way for other people to be activists. I think it's all about having pride in where you come from, having pride in what you represent, and uh, just understanding, you know, this is people's work. So both of you used the word connected, or feeling connected to other people throughout this. This is a connected learning conference. So it's worth remembering that the connected in this case does include notions of intersectionality, right? Which is a principle that seemed to emerge organically in almost every conversation I have these days with young activists. So maybe we could start say a little more about intersectionality and how that affects the works that you're involved with. Uh, Jessica, you want to start us? I mean, intersectionality, I think it's so crucial. People don't realize how by taking part in something, you're, in a, uh, you're hitting other different aspects. So like for example, right now, uh, taking part of March for Our Lives, a lot of what we're doing is fighting against gun violence. But within that, there's also an understanding that like we're connecting it, how like a lot of gun violence is due uh, to police brutality. So we're able to connect that with that then you could be able to connect with the whole aspect of why gun violence occurs, like the whole aspect of mental health, which is also becoming a priority for us. Then you're able to connect it to like different areas. This automatically expresses how each and every single one of our causes, they're intersectional with one another because in the end they all connect. Like they connect in different manners where like just being able to address something, you're slowly addressing other issues. And it is really important to be able to stand together. I think that's why we are seeing more so than ever before. So whether it's nonprofits to multiple organizations standing together, because in the end, each and every single one of our causes and our connect with one another when it comes to being able to fight and make sure that voices are being heard. Um, can you repeat the question one more time? About intersectionality and how that fits into the work that you're, you're doing. Right. Um, so, uh, like I said earlier, I do a lot of work within education. And um, intersectionality is very important when it comes to education because um, I believe that uh, education is where it all starts. Um, schooling, uh, as, as a child, is where you get sculpted into the human being that you're going to be in adulthood. Uh, you go through all of these different experiences. Um, and so when it comes to education, I feel like education is at the intersection of all these different types of identities, all these different factors that have a play into uh, your individualized like reality, your individual reality. So. Um, when it comes to my work, I focus a lot on uh, the intersection of education and police brutality. Uh, like I said, the criminalization of black, brown, and Muslim youth. Um, I feel like it's important to understand that race has a strong, uh, has a strong presence in education and the educational realities of certain students. And then it also has a, a, a strong, um, a, a, a strong uh, presence when it comes to that those certain students' relationship with the police. So we have to understand all of these intersectional elements when it comes to understanding the people, again. Because these people that you're representing as an activist have so many different things that they're dealing with. So to accurately address the needs of those people, you have to understand their intersectional identities, whether that's gender, sexuality, race, socioeconomic status. We have to understand how all of these factors come into play so that we can best represent our community and address the needs of our community, all people in our communities. Um, so intersectionality is extremely important. Well, thank you. So Connected also in our context means new media and the what role that digital media plays. And I wanted to hear a little bit about what roles digital media has played in the work that you do, what opportunities it's created, and maybe what risk it's contributed. Oh, for sure. Jessica, you wanna? Well, a lot of what we do actually has to do with the media. Like, it is so hard 
well, California is huge to begin with. <laughs> like it's really huge. So um, a lot of what we track when we connect, uh, whether from Northern California to Southern California, the best way we do that is through the media. So whether it goes through social media, whether it being like Facebook, Twitter, um, towards like actually being able to use different websites to be able to message one another. A lot of what is used is stuff such as Slack. I am seeing that used more so in di different organizations that I've contributed in than ever before. We have been able to do like actual like videos to be able to talk. We literally just had voter uh, na uh, the National Voter Registration Day. We did like a video where uh, every single one of our board member like was uh, just reminding people the importance of voting and like why they should register to vote. So it's, we've been able to use that because as we have seen, as we have uh, progress as a nation and as we have just advanced, we are seeing media become one of the main resources that is used in order to connect people from all kinds. Like we are strictly connected, from whether if we do something here, we can know what's happening in DC because we're all connected to this whole aspect of the media and it is really beautiful to see that like, we support one another in different areas. We message each other on different aspects. So I think it is very, very important to be able to use it and utilize it well, because that is also part of the issue. When it's not utilized well, there's a lot of issues that could occur. Like in regards when we post a message or something, it's also easy to be getting a lot of hate comments. Like we have gotten way too many on how we're gonna die to like what they're gonna do to us and so on just simply because we are standing on so uh, against like certain issues that people go uh, in favor of. And just as a reminder, all my students, and I tell them my children because I'm the oldest one, they're from the age of 10 to 23, 10 to 23 years old. And they're getting messages sent to them on how they're gonna die. What does that say about our nation? That is something that is horrifying and something that's tragic because these young people are using their voice in their best capacity to being able to transcend a message of importance because this is beyond important. We are in a time where we need to stand together and solidify it and we're using that in the best possible ways but also in using it in the best possible ways. We are also being put in the attention aspect where we get so much hate that's sent towards us and it's just being able to move past that. Now we just, uh, if people wanna comment, they can't necessarily comment. We are trying to move well, towards the whole thing because I'm trying to protect my children because for me, each and every single one of them are my children because I'm the one that oversees them. And it is sad when I get one of them calling me crying because they saw something that was beyond horrifying. So it's, we're using it in the best capacity, but at the same time, it's like we're, I'm trying to protect them and like taking comments off, being able to like get them a certain times to like watch like Twitter and so on, because I wanna make sure that at the end they don't lose their innocence, because I do have such a variety of young people, and I wanna make sure that their innocence is protected as much as possible, because I think it, it is really sad to see how we are waking up so quickly. It is something positive because we are having this youth revolution and I'm all for it, but it's also really important to make sure that at the end we remind ourselves that these are just children and they need the support of their mentors and their elders to know that no matter what, they have a support system. Um, yeah. Um, I think when we talk media, it's, a, it's important to understand there are different types of media. Um, social media, I think, has been great, especially for the movements that I'm involved in. Uh, organ I'm a leader in an organization called Students Deserve. Um, and, and Students Deserve, we use the media, social media all the time. Um, like last school year, um, the superintendent of Los Angeles Unified School District is named Austin Buettner. Um, this is a man who is working to privatize uh, the Los Angeles Unified Public School District. And so um, this would uh, 
this th using social media as a mode to really use our own voice and not have someone else rewrite our story um, or our viewpoints has been very effective for us. What, last year we had this demonstration at the Santa Monica Pier where we reenacted what random searches look like. To a lot of people, it, no one really understood what was happening in classrooms because students are in classrooms. Teachers are in classrooms. So if you're not a student or a teacher, it's very hard to visualize what the, this experience could look like. So in order to combat that, we videotaped our demonstration of a random search at the pier. We broadcasted it on Facebook Live, on Instagram. We put it on Twitter. Um, uh, Black Lives Matter reposted our stuff. So, so in uh, videotaping these demonstrations and um, really using our voice, you build a connection between all different types of movements. And I think that's the beauty of it. Social media allows you to connect what you're doing, what someone next to you is doing, what someone across the country is doing, and realizing that y'all are all fighting the same issue. So it, 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 uh, by connecting, it allows you all to be on a bigger platform. Um, but I think it's social media or the media becomes dangerous when we aren't allowed to tell our own stories. When it comes to news outlets, we have to be careful, especially as youth activists, um, in who we choose to associate ourselves with. We don't know if the New York Times or if, um, like, whoever, the time, uh, it doesn't matter, like New York Times, Washington Post, we don't know if these uh, different news outlets are going to accurately represent our story or accurately tell our story to the world. We want to trust these big media outlets, but it's so hard because they oftentimes, even if it's not intentional, they oftentimes tend to euphemize what we're doing. We as youth are doing very, very important work, like Jessica said. So just because we are children, that does not mean that we're not doing the work that is needed. We have the experience in the classroom. We know what's going on. Yeah, thank you. So um, I think it's very important when we have these conversations on the media to understand that, you know, me social media is great because we can tell our own story, but these big media outlets are not t accurately telling the story of the youth or accurately giving us the platform to do so for ourselves. I would rather a big media outlet like the Washington Post to allow students to co-write a news article on our movement. Why are students not in the newsroom with these people who are writing our stories? So um, I think it's very important to understand that when we talk about youth and we talk about the media. Thank you for that. Okay. So we've already established in this room where most of us educators of one sort or another, I guess all of us are, many of you raised your hand when I asked about activism. So I want us to think about young people in our lives and what roles we can play to support and enable their activism as opposed to being a problem or blockage. And I'd ask them both to reflect a little bit on what they would want educators to hear about the experience of young activists. So Justin, why don't you start us this time? Um, uh, I know for me, educators have been of extreme importance to not only my experience with activism, uh, but also just my experience with the world. Educators have given me, um, educators I'm talking about in school and outside of school, have given me the tools I need to accurately maneuver even the activist world. Um, so I feel like as elders to the youth, you all can create counter spaces for us to really explore our own identities and explore how our identities will interact with the world. Um, so I think the best way to do that is, is to come from a place of, of, of real discussion. In the classroom, it should not be a, a one-sided discussion. It should not be only the educator educating. I feel like everyone in the classroom has something to offer. 
And so if we understand that students too have this experiential knowledge, this experiential intelligence uh, on their own experiences with how to maneuver the world, and we use that in the classroom and build upon what they already have experienced, we, we not only see more fascination in the youth, but we also see the youth really feeling empowered. We see students raising their hand in the classroom. We see students really going out of their own way to be more involved in the community because they start to feel like the community is theirs. The classroom is not only the teacher's classroom, it's the students in the community's classroom. So I think if we create counter spaces where the youth are, are able to really explore all of their different uh, uh, viewpoints, all of their different identities, all of the different parts of the world that they may not have a had access to, but uh, are still coming from a place of um, really being acknowledged, then we, we really see the youth start to own the voice that they already have. So uh, I think as educators, as activists and educators, it's important to cultivate that voice, that voice of the youth that's so powerful, that's so vibrant, that's so full of enthusiasm. It, it really hurts me when I see my peers feel uh, um, like their power is taken away from them in a lecture. It really is a tragedy. So I think we should create these comfortable spaces where students can be wrong, can fail, but still feel empowered and still feel like their voice is very, very important. So I think that's what uh, you all can do as educators. Just, just make sure your students feel the love. It's okay to say I love you to your students. Really, it is. Um, because that makes them feel seen. That makes us feel important and that makes us feel heard. So please, and implement more love in the classroom and elsewhere. Okay, Jessica. Um, well, I am very fortunate to be here. I think I honestly wouldn't be here if it weren't for my educators. Like, my story goes histories of whether it was like losing loved ones and like not being able to transfer at a proper time towards like just issues at home. And if it wasn't for the push and the support of the educators that I had throughout this, throughout my lifetime, I literally wouldn't be standing here. So I thank each and every single one of you because your voice matters and like the people that you speak to, like it makes an impact and I am very grateful to be here for that because my educators were the best support system besides my mom and my parents. So, um, mm -hmm. but I am very grateful because a lot of my educators were the people that I saw as second parents that helped take me along the way, especially being a first generation college student. I didn't have the resources or the abilities to be able to have a system of support because I didn't have like someone to look upon and be able to say, oh, like they know the struggle. Let me see how I could be move my way around there to like get my educational career. And it was just through like having someone like literally like kind of take my hand and take me, show me the way step by step that I wouldn't be here. But with that said, something that I've been able to see, especially right now in Northern California that we actually been discussing is for educators especially, uh, is to support educators are people of color. I think there's a lack of diversity when it comes to our educational system. I think in regards to the student ratio versus like the people educating them, it doesn't make an appropriate account that there's not enough representation when it comes to having educators of color to be able to teach their stories and be able to properly tell uh, the stories of the struggle and being able to like educate people of color. I think I never really felt that sense of support as much as I should have because I didn't see a professor that looked like me to be able to like understand the struggle and be able to like, okay, I understand this, like let me see what I can do. Because by not being able to have a sense of support when it came to like seeing a professor that looked just like me, I think it became harder to understand the proper system. So for all my educators, I would say that big thing for me would be supporting the educators are people of color. I think it is really important for them to have that sense of support because they, at least from what I've seen and what I see right now in Northern California, they have gone through so many struggles in being able to like 
be there for their students, but due to the lack of diversity that exists, and not only like here on a nationwide scale, I've been able to see that there's not enough support system, which oftentimes leads to a low graduation rate from our students. Um, like I've seen uh, uh, working a lot right now with the UCs and CSU, the low graduation rates in a lot of the schools, and we are seeing that a lot of our low graduation rates have to do with students of color. They have a lower graduation rate than any before. Um, so I think it's by being able to express the diversity when it comes towards the educational system by those that are a sense of representation, whether it being administration towards uh, the professors that are teaching us, we would be able to see a better support system and for students to actually do better because they would just feel that sense of empowerment that it's like if they could do it, then so can I. And I think for me that is something that empowers me to be able to see like right now in Sacramento, like all my, uh, my Latino educators, I'm like, oh yes, like I wanna be just like you. Like, oh my gosh, you're moving me and everything. Like, and I'm so pumped. But it was because I never seen so many Latina women be educators. And for me, that was such an empowerment. It's like now I actually am, am looking forward to going to grad school. And I never thought about grad school before. But it was just being able to have that sense of empowerment by seeing a sense of representation when it came to my professors that now I am looking towards a better future where I could be able to teach what they taught me towards new, newer generations. So for me, that is the biggest step to being able to see that sense of support system besides obviously, as Justin said, being able to give our students a platform to speak their truths, being able to give students the ability to tell their individual stories. I think our voices, especially being a woman of color, our voices go so many times untold and you don't really have the sense of the full story when it comes to understanding the struggle because there's so much that is left open-ended, and I think by being able to give students of color that sense of platform, we would be able to move forward where students of color would feel that sense of support and then be able to feel empowered to do better. And that is everything for educators. I am here once again because it was due to all the support that I have had in my life that empowered me to continue expressing my voice, to continue challenging myself. I honestly, W wouldn't be here if like I didn't have like sometimes like hard educators would be like get your get your ass rolling because like you have so much to, like and sometimes I was like oh yeah I kind of don't like you right now but like I, I like if it wasn't for that sense of push I would have been here because like they really challenged myself to be someone better and be able to tell my individual story because I had a story to tell. So. I'm going to turn it over to, you, to questions on the floor in just a minute. I want to ask one more question of our panelists, but if, if you want to start thinking about your questions, um, please do so. So one of the things we've been doing is going around America asking people to think about the future. And ideally, what does the world of 20, the ideal world of 2060 look like? When we survive the current crisis and start to make a better society, what is that like? Because it seems to me with activists, it's as important to know what you're fighting for as what you're fighting against. So I wanted to ask you, maybe Justin, if you could get us started, what is the ideal future of 2060 look like to you? Of 2060? Yeah, I mean, we're just saying 40 years mm -hmm. in the future, so we get out of the current impasse and can think about a different world. Um, you know, I would, I, I love the um, current trend when it comes to activism. Um, my hope is that we stay authentic in our pursuits. We stay true to, again, our communities. We stay true to the resources that our communities need and want um, and deserve. Um, and I think that um, there is a critical conscious bug flying around this country right now. People are seeking out information and people are becoming more critical of the world around them. But at the same time, I feel like there's a large trend uh, towards uh, the, the very opposite of that. I think uh, there's also a trend of people completely disregarding information completely disregarding historical context, 
that's so important to everything uh, when it comes to the way America is set up right now, the world is set up right now. So I would hope that in 2060, we, we remember this context. We remember history. We remember right now. We remember that there were students fighting for gun control, for environmental justice, for uh, police brutality to end, for, to end the criminalization of youth in general. I, I, I hope that we remember these things that are going on right now, because right now is a very historical time. And right now is going to be a time where I feel like my kids are going to look back on and say, wow, um, my, parent was, my parents, my parents <laughs> were involved in a generation that was really standing up for what they believe in. So I would hope that we remember these times and times like this and we continue this trend of just activism, this trend of remembering that um, people deserve the best that this world has to offer. Nobody is greater than anybody else. And so I hope that the world starts to remember that. I hope that the world remembers that we're all accountable for this earth and for what happens on this planet. And, and um, I hope that we get back, to our, get back to the people, get back to the community. I feel like right now there's a large separation between everyday people and the people that are running this country. And I would hope that that'll change. But um, right now, to be quite honest, I'm not sure where we are going to stand in 2060. I think there is a lot of hope in the youth, a lot of hope in youth of color in particular. Um, and we just really need to trust them as a, as a society. Um, I feel like right now, even though there are a lot of youth activists, it is a fad, and it is something that people are very fascinated about right now. I just hope that this fascination has longevity, um, and it's not something that's here today and gone tomorrow, and that we follow these youth activists of now into adulthood and are still fascinated with them in adulthood. Understand that their voice is not only powerful because they're youth, but powerful because they're people with a unique set of experiences as we all are, are unique and we all are activists in some sort. So I just hope that we remember this in the future and we allow this to trickle into all parts of our life, life politically, economically, socially. Um, and so yeah, that's where I hope we are in 2016. Okay. And Jessica? Well, I'm gonna get a little bit political. Um, in 2015, the United Nations passed the Sustainable Development Goals, which was 17 goals that would be implemented by 2030. A lot of those goals are, were goals that were signed by each and every single one of the countries around the world, yet they're not being discussed around the whole world. Specifically, the United States has taken a stance where instead of moving forward, they are regressing. We are seeing uh, whether it went with the Paris Climate Accords towards like the whole aspect of not taking part in so many different issues, which I could go on and on, but that would be way too long. Um, but in regards to it, these goals are goals that are our future. We could go with the goal number one, which was ending poverty at its roots to stuff where it came to the, our climate change towards like uh, equality, towards so many different issues. These are 17 goals that were seen and signed by every single country, yet why are we not discussing them? For me, that is my question to every single country. I think it is the importance of being able to bring these different stuff that we signed to be able to really address the issues that are gonna directly impact us in the future. We have, we're practically in 2020. We have 10 years to be able to make all these changes. Yet, how could we make these changes if these changes are not even being spoken about? And I think in order, to, when I see in regards towards 2060, I really think about everything that is happening right now. I truly think that these were proper goals that were being brought upon that could be able to make systemic change, that could be able to change our whole world in, a, in the best possible ways. Because I think if we are able to address each and every single one of these issues, which were 17 in total, we could be able to move towards a better future 
where we don't have to worry about the newer generations because these issues would be addressed. Whether it comes through climate, which is being spoken about more so than ever before right now. Whether it comes to poverty, where we are seeing spikes in homelessness. Like, I've been able to travel around the whole world, of, uh, well, no, around the whole country right now with this movement. And I am seeing more so than ever before people, homeless people throughout every single city. And that is something that is not being discussed upon. Yet we say that like when it comes towards like how we are doing as a country, we are doing better, but how are we doing better if our people are not doing better? Like that is something that I question myself every single one of my days that I am in existence. We can't really talk about the future if we're not talking about the past or the present. We are, we are seeing more so than ever before people struggling on a continuous basis. So I think and if we really want to be able to see a better future for 2060, we really have to address these issues because as a reminder, these were issues that were signed by every single country. Yet why are we not really discussing these issues? These should be the issues that everyone takes into importance because these were issues that were recognized to be the fundamental issues that we are facing as a, glo uh, as a global society. So I think if we want to, for what I see in 2060, would be if we actually are able to address these issues within the next 10 years, we would be seeing a global society where we don't have to worry about like, uh, well, uh, uh, like the whole aspect, like a lot of poverty issues, where we don't have to worry about the environment every single day that if we're gonna go out of existence because uh, due to global uh, carbon dioxide and then like our, just like our greenhouse emissions and so on, and that could go on because I'm in Model UN, so I'm learning all this right now. Um, mm -hmm. So like uh, we could be able to go on and on in regards to every single individual issue. And I could talk way too much about this because like this is, I'm taking the UNHCR, so a lot about all these issues right now. So it, it's something that really hits me straight to the core because it's like, how could we as a global society be able to discuss that we are thinking about the future and we're not really even addressing the issues as of right now? So for me, 2060 looks, if taken the proper measures, we are gonna see a world like never before where we could be able to see poverty go down. We could be able to see where like, we don't have to worry about our environmental issues, where we could be able to see where women's uh, like, our pay go up, because like, my dear woman, I love you, but like, we really got to like, be able to empower our men to stand in solidarity with their female counterparts to being able to make sure that their voices are being heard. Like, we could go on and on and all this, but that's only if we take the proper measures, because if we don't, I honestly don't see a world where we're gonna, I honestly see millions of people dying, to be honest, because we are in, uh, as the UN said, we are entering our seventh mass extinction. If we really don't take actions when it comes to climate change, if we don't take actions when it comes to talking about poverty, if we don't take actions when it comes to talking about equality, if we don't take actions when it comes to any of these issues. And we are the people that are in the present that have the ability to be able to change each and every single one of these issues. The only issues is that we got to stand in solidarity. We as educators should teach our students the importance of how, how important their voice is and what they could be able to use, what they could be able to do with their voice in order to be able to change this because we have that sense of power. We carry that power within each and every single one of us to empower the next generations so they won't keep repeating the same mistakes that our current administration is doing, not only here, but like in every single other country. But the only way that we can do that is by each and every single one of us standing in solidarity and being able to tell people enough is enough. We gotta stand together and be able to fight against this because we're all working class individuals and we have the power to be able to change it. It's the only thing is that we ought to we all have to come in unity to be able to stand together and be able to see that we want something better for 2060 and the only way we can do that is standing side by side. All right, we are about to run out of time, but we have time for maybe one or two quick questions. Uh, so yes, there's a woman right down here. Okay. Oh, uh, thank you uh, all so much, Justin and Jessica. You are very inspiring. Uh, my name is David Lowenstein. I work at PBS Kids. You know, you give me a lot of hope because I get, I'm very uh, 
disappointed and frustrated about the impasse that we're, we currently have, where people, where where it's like the balkanization of our media, where you know a, a set of people are only watching Fox News or listening to Rush Limbaugh and Mark Levin, and then the rest of us are listening to everyone else, <laughs> you know, and like the hundreds of other outlets that are saying one thing. But but I want I, I wonder as as young people if you're experiencing that, and maybe Jessica, because you're in Sacramento, you are more than Justin, who's in L.A. Uh, because I think L.A. is kind of like this room and. But, but are you experiencing people who have a different set of facts and are listening to you know, Fox News? And how, how, how frustrating is that? Or how, what, what hope do you have that there's going to be more uh, discussion and people recognizing we are, we, there's one set of facts and, and being able to disagree about policy but not disagreeing about what a fact is? Um, that is actually a very good question. And I really did notice that when I moved to Sacramento. There is such a big difference between Sacramento and here in LA. I really realized that. I remember I attended this LULAC meeting and they're like, sweetheart, this isn't nothing like LA or Orange County. It's like people are not gonna hear you, you stand by yourself. That was such a culture shock for me because like here, like uh, in LA, it's so on, like everyone stands together, something happens, it's like protests, like and so on. And then like being able to have people and sensory presentation to be able to see the divide that exists within Sacramento, that was such a culture shock for me because I come from like a community, whether even though I have faced oppression and racism, uh, in the end, I had had so much support system. So there is a big divide that exists. There is a lot of people that uh, just, you either stand in one side or you stand in the other. There's no middle ground where people are able to understand that, like there's more to the story than what people are being told. So I've been able to truly see that in regards to it. Thankfully, when it comes towards education, and that is a big one, and I really take that. Sacramento State, uh, the professors are big supporters of every single cause that their students fight for. I've been able to uh, miss classes at times, well, making up my work obviously later, but like have missed classes with the support of my professors that are like, I stand in solidarity with you, sweetheart, you do you, come do, and then like being able to give extra credit. So I think a lot of it and being able to truly be able to move forward is by being able to have the sense of support from your educators that help you along the way because they understand the struggle more so than any other individual. And I think by being able to really have that sensory presentation when it comes to the educational sense, we could be able to move forward and be really able to help our students understand that they shouldn't go for one side or the other. Like they need to be able to expand their minds and be able to understand the issues that are happening around them in order to be able to address those issues and just being able to move forward. But yes, in regards to Sacramento, there's a lot of issues up there. But like, I am not one to stay silent, so I'm always at the Capitol, like every other day. In between classes, I go to class, come out of class, and just go to the Capitol. Well, it's not, it's just talk about social media, but it's, it's become such an echo chamber, right? Where mm -hmm. it's like only people that are following your social media are people that, that so agree with you. So how, how do you deal with that? How do you cross and, 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 and try to get other people to hear your point? Here's the uh, fun, yet sort of the dangerous part of activism you make people hear you. So I think um, going into these school board meetings with uh, people who are very, very pro-private education and, and talking about the value of public education, seeing these different facts literally side by side um, and acknowledging the bias that may come when, when these facts are collected and when these experiments and then when this research is conducted, um, it can be very nerve wracking at times. But I think that's our duty as activists, as educators, as scholars, as uh, real people that experience these different issues. I think it's our responsibility to um, let people know that govern us, or uh, make sure that they know that these issues are very real. Um, these different things that we're encountering on a day-to-day -day basis really affect students, really affect people in general. So um, I think confronting these issues head on and these facts head on that other people may not see is a large part of it. I think also too, 
I'm, I'm deeply involved in arts activism. So I use the arts via poetry, via demonstrations, via acting, via um, film, whatever, in order to healthily, uh, to, to, so that that can be like a, a, a mold and I can, I can sculpt uh, somebody's point of view through that or I can, I can present a different viewpoint in, in sort of a, a, a less confrontational way so that people really understand and aren't directly opposed as soon as I open my mouth. So I think it's a large part of being an activist is, is finding those different ways that you can interact with people that have different viewpoints than you so that we can have one large conversation. Um, so yeah, that's how I think you confront that. So alas, uh, time is tight and I have to cut us off, I'm sorry. Uh, but um, I hope you will join me in sharing my appreciation for these two remarkable young voices. So thanks, thanks to everybody. Thanks to, to Justin and Jessica and Henry. And that was really, really inspiring way to, to start the day. I will say that I have some ideas for what uh, I'd like 2060 to look like. Um, and I think uh, if we get there, it's going to be because of actions like the two of yours. Um, and so on behalf of my generation, I hand over the reins to the country <laughs> to you right now, because it will be in better hands. Thank you. Um, on that note, uh, so thank you, uh, thank you for, 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 uh, for this great session. Um, I want to make a reminder for later in the day, we do have a long day in front of us and, and lots of caffeine in front of you to help you get through it. Um, at 5 o'clock, uh, we have the Ignite Talks that will be in this room. Um, and then that will be followed by, at 6 o'clock, the tech demos and a reception next door um, So uh, from 6 to 7. Um, so please make sure you stick around for both those things at the end of the day. Thanks.